Yeah. <laughs> Great. So let's um, get going. Uh, so I'm going to do a bit more of the visualization stuff that we talked about um, last time. And I'm gonna, we're going to end some way is highlighting a couple of issues and looking more of why we want to do visualization that's going to lead to, uh, yeah, you'll see where we end up. <laughs> but basically, we motivated this whole thing is that Neil said this thing that data science is not programming, is like debugging. And then I said, what is your fprint FSTDERR in data science? Well, it is visualizing stuff, right? That's how you poke into the data that you have. Uh, and we looked at different ways of doing that, right? The first thing that we said was that, well, let's say add this data. Well, the nice thing that I can do, and we did this by not looking at that sine wave first, we just looked at this distance matrix, right? And we said, oh, actually, we all figured out that that distance matrix came from a sine wave, right? And we took some additional, we took some other data that looked pretty really swanky, this exponential in a sine wave, and we could also figure this out, right? And that's really nice. Uh, where this becomes really nice is that when this data is super high dimensional, right? So just an example of that, these two images, this is the exact one from the previous case. That one, I took that same function and mapped it to 100 dimensions, and I calculated the distance matrix, right? So here, we are visualizing an n by n matrix, the relationship between every point to every other data point of something that I definitely can plot, right? This is a sine wave scattered in 100 dimensions, right? This is going to be really, really tedious to figure out what it is. But if I look at this, well, I kind of get that structure straight away, right? So this is a really good way of poking in the data. And we said that obviously that matrix is going to look completely different dependent on the type of 
measure that we have to compare things. And I just gave this. Uh, you said this is a really nice function called cdish. It basically removes having to write two for loops. Uh, so what it would do is that we would just say, if you give it two vectors, it would just compute the, the distance between every possible combination of points that generate that matrix. The interesting thing is that the metric you can choose. And these here are the metrics that you can choose. And you can also create a callable function. So if you come up with some bonkers measure, if you're working on some really specific domain where they actually have a notion of similarity, you can actually put this into this as well. Right? So all these things, this is a really, really useful tool to figure out what the data actually looks like. So then we went on and we talked about dimensionality reduction. So the question is, we said that there's like two different types of dimensionality of data. So it's the representation or the dimensionality of the representation itself. So I've been given this data for some reason. I used an image as an example. So I gave you this image and said, cool. You can think about this image as a point in a really, really high dimensional space. The reason why it is an image like that is because the capturing device of how we gather that data, right? We have a sensor which takes in light and it generates a pixel on a grid. But most of that space where that image lives is completely empty, right? Well, it doesn't contain natural images for sure, right? We said that if you would draw, take a box, normalize that thing, and you will use draw random samples, the likelihood that you're going to get an image that actually looks like something that could come from the real world is pretty small, right? So that means that the actual dimensionality of the data is much, much lower than the dimensionality of the representation, right? And it would be really useful to be able to extract the dimensionality of the data instead, right? So why does this come up, right? It comes up clearly because two pixels in an image are not independent, right? There's a relationship between pretty much every pixel in an image that makes it that, and they form some form of surface which we call the manifold, right? And now what we would ideally want to do is to be able to extract coordinates on that manifold and parameterize the data in that way. So then if I move around on that manifold, every point represents an image. That would be super useful to be able to do, right? You can argue that that's the whole field of computer vision. So we said, first thing, before we go on to something that might be able to do that, the easiest thing that we can do is something called principal components analysis. And the way we do this is through the I and D composition of a covariance matrix. And the I and D composition is used what we call a similarity transform. So it's a very peculiar similarity transform. So we said that the matrix A and the matrix capital lambda, in this case, are called similar matrices. And they're called similar matrices because these two matrices here, D, are just transformations. So you transform one way, and then you transform back, right? That's what these two matrices do, right? So you can think of them in the easiest case, it's just a rotation matrix, right? So in one way, I go back, and now I have the representation in the rotated frame, and then I rotate back, okay? So that's what the eigen decomposition is. And we said that what we can do, oh, sorry, is that we can take something like this, where we have this data, we can compute the covariance matrix of this. So the covariance matrix will then parameterize how much variation do I have along this axis, how much variation do I have along this axis, and how much covariance, variance, variance, how much covariance do I have between the dimensions, right? And now what we would want to do is if we diagonalize that matrix, we would want to say, if that's diagonal, I have it now in a representation. I have variance here, variance there, but I don't have any cross covariance. Right? I don't have any covariance between them. Right? So now I have a, a representation which effectively makes the data independent. 
right? And more importantly, if I can order these two, if I can order the variance, so I could say, well, this one is really big, the next one is much smaller, and this one is tiny, what I can do is I can hope that I can cut smaller dimensions, right? So for example, in this case, if we would diagonalize this covariance matrix and then represent the data in that space, you would find, which we had on the next image, you would find this representation. This is you taking this here, the rotation to that space, apply to this data, and I get this, right? Now I've got a covariance matrix here, which is the covariance matrix in the new space. And that is going to say that this dimension is much, much more varying than the top one. And I can now, if I wanted, if I really wanted this to be one dimensional, I could cut the y axis, right? Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Very good. So, what do we do when we do this? Use as an algorithm. You compute the empirical covariance matrix of the data. So if the data is centered, this is the inner product between. Then you diagonalize this, so you get a um, a representation in capital uh, lambda, and then you take that matrix and you project the data onto this. If you do that, you now have a representation of the data in this new one which has decorrelated the dimensions. And if you want to make this lower dimensional, you just cut the basis vectors here that correspond to the highly varying bits, right? This makes sense? I'm quite quick now because we talked about this last time, but this, as I said, I wrote it in very large capital letters. You always have to do PCA, always, right? Good. So I showed this example, but I plotted it in a different way. What I did in this case, this was this mocap data that I found on the internet somewhere. Um, what this data was that it was a six dimensional data set. The way I've plotted it now is that we should just see the dimension. So this here is in five, and then it's these six signals that I have. It is six, right? One, two, three, four, five. Uh, these signals. And what I've done to just make them visible, I've just shifted them. I, they're actually all said that they're on zero, but when I did that, it just looked like a mess. So I just moved them up like this. Right? Okay, so let's see what we can figure out by applying PCA to this data. You can see that it looks like, you can kind of see that there is quite a few patterns going on, right? This one here, the second one, clearly has this periodicity. Which kind of follows in the other ones, but it goes, they, they have a bit more action in between these. Okay. So the two things that I get out then, if I apply PCA to this, is that I get this, which is the covariant, the diagonal of the covariant matrix, right? Because the off diagonal elements are all zero. Right? So I've just plotted the diagonal elements of this. What it says here is that, you know, this here is the most varying direction that I have in the data because it's the highest one. Then this here, each column here, is one of those vectors. Okay. So now I can go and I can look in this one which dimensions are actually active, right? To generate whatever the data varies along this dimension, we multiply with this vector, right? So what I can see here, now the scale of this is a little bit, because the, you could have negative values and positive values. So the, something that's this here is the largest positive and this is the largest negative. So this is actually a, a quite, it's quite far from zero. But I can look at this when I can see that dimension looks to be a mix between the second, the fourth, and the fifth dimension in the data. And now we can go back and say, somehow there is a grouping of correlation that happens between those dimensions. 
And then you go something like this one here, so the last dimension, which is not massively varying. So you can see this one has really picked out this, the fifth, and the first. And this one here, actually, it looks a bit counterintuitive. But these ones are close to zero, and this one's massively negative, actually. So the third dimension, he says, is quite unique. I can't really find any correlations with other dimensions for that one. So we can go back and look at the third, which is the green one in this case. And I could quite possibly agree with that. The, that one looks a little bit different to everything else, right? So it picks out that one and says, I can't really, another way of thinking, I can't really use the other dimensions to explain that one. So I kind of have to keep it on its own. And because it has quite a bit of variance, it's still going to be there in the data, right? So you see how this type of reasoning, you can now start in a loop where you look at this kind of stuff, then you start removing dimensions. You might group them in different ways. So that this can be a really good way of actually probing what the data is doing. Yeah, we all happy about this type of analysis, looking at these things. Awesome, very good. So then, and this was where I ran out of time. And I mean, we started off right and talking about how nice these matrices were, these distant matrices between everything, right? How we could interpret stuff from them and how they are an effect, they don't take in the dimension, they're independent of the dimensionality of the data, right? Because the distance measure is always one dimensional. Okay? But then we move very quickly to look at covariance matrices instead. And these were these very small matrices. Now, in this case, this here was n by n, and this was d by d. So can we do something when we actually think of these matrices and get the di a reduced dimensional representation instead, right? So you can think about this thing. We have this distance along this sine wave. Can I extract a representation using this instead of using this? Because this here, is actually a representation, or it comes from the from the uh, representation that I've been given the data with itself, right? Because this is the, okay. So we can, and to do that, we need to do one thing first. So we want we are going to formulate an error function or an objective function that says points that I think are really similar. I want to find a representation where they remain similar and things that are dissimilar, I think should be dissimilar, right? But the most important thing is the similar stuff is similar. So a distance measure is not a similarity measure, it's a dissimilarity measure, right? If something is exactly the same, it's zero. So I want the measure, that's the other way around, right? So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna use the inner product between vectors as a measure instead, because that is a dissimilarity measure, okay? Oh, similarity measure, Lord. So you can kind of think, and I hope just this sketch makes sense, if I could compute the inner product between all these vectors, so effectively project them all onto each other, well, that is, there's no way, if I have all those values, I can't move I can't change this triangle. I, I can rotate it and translate it, but I can't actually make a different shape of a triangle, right? It's rigid if I project all these things onto each other, right? That's the uh, um, inner product. If I also give you all the distances between this, it's the same thing, right? I can't do everything, right? So what you actually can do is that there is an equivalence is between the distance between two things and the inner product between two things. It's exactly the same thing up to a rotation and a scaling, which makes perfect sense. So very simply, you can just see this by this. If I take and write the distance matrix like that, well, it's just a set of inner products, right? And if making the assumption that the data is centered, 
then I can derive the inner product matrix from this. Okay. Cool. Don't worry about this is much more important than that. Right. Okay. So if I do that, this is used the inner product, or the this is often called the gram matrix of the same X sign function that we had before. These two are exactly the same, right? And I can actually derive this one from this and vice versa. And now we have this behavior instead on the diagonals, where in the previous case, we had all these, uh, where it was zero on the diagonal, and I have a copy of that. Good. So the question then is, given one of these similarity matrices, can I find a vectorial representation such that that representation matches that similarity matrix? Right? Given this, so I don't even know where the data came from. You've given me one of these matrices. Can I come up with a vectorial representation such that if I compute a inner product matrix, it will become this one, right? Now I will have a representation of the data. You're following this? Yeah, good. Not the heads, I like it. Good. So we have this matrix here in this case. It's used going to be in a product between everything. And then what we're going to do is we're going to formulate an objective function that says, I want to have the representation y that where d here is that inner product matrix from that y such that it minimizes, and I'll explain what this norm is, the Frobenius norm to the matrix that you gave me. The Frobenius norm is very, very simple. It's the most natural thing. So normally when we write element-wise matrix norm, we use things like this. We take, it's exactly how you would do with a vector. In this case, you would take each element, raise it to P, sum them, and then you'll take uh, PQ, and then you'll take one over PQ, or one over P. So if you do this with the Frobenius norm, it's P is two, which means what you're called Q is two. So what you're effectively doing is you're taking two matrices, subtracting them from each other, then you're squaring each element, you're summing that and taking the square root, right? So it's the notion of the Euclidean measure or distance, but just for a matrix instead, right? So the simplest thing we can find, thank you. Okay, so what we're going to do then is that we want to find this D, where this D comes from some Y, where D is just the product of Y, Y, T, that minimizes this, okay? So the Frobenius norm turns out it's just the trace of the difference between these two things, okay? So I can rewrite it like that. So I take the difference, I square it, and then I take the trace of this. So what I'm free to do, this doesn't make any difference, is that I'm now going to take this D and write it in an, in an eigen-decomposed manner. I'm just altering how I write this matrix. Right? It's still a square matrix. So I'm going to take some basis vector and some diagonal matrix here. And I'm going to write it like this. So instead of finding D directly, I'm just going to change the problem into this. Okay, so I have some form of transformation, and then I have a diagonal matrix. And this one here, I'll do the same thing. So I do the eigen decomposition of both of these matrices. This one I have, this one I don't know what it is. So then, what I can do in this case. This is just the matrix. Whatever I write in here, this is the matrix. The trace of that matrix is invariant if I do this type of transformation. So I can now decide it to just pick the eigenvectors of the matrix that I have, and I'm just going to put them on each side. Right? Okay. 
This is a super verbose, right? I'll give you a PDF sheet of me deriving this thing. I'm so bad at math, so I have to write every step. Cool? So, just move this in, write it like this. Now we've got this nice thing. Remember, these matrices were very peculiar. So these here, we use these simple transformation matrices, where the inverse is the same as the transpose. This thing here cancels, this thing here cancels. So I've ended up with this. Okay. So now the thing I don't have in this case is this. This is the thing that we're looking at this. Right? Okay, so let's just take a step back now. So what I'm trying to do here is that I've got a diagonal matrix, and then I want to make the difference to this as small as possible. Okay. So what's the most important, another way of thinking about it, I want to break this so that it cancels out lots of elements in this. Right. So what should I pick this as? So again, as B. B. Um, let's think about it again. So, so if what what would be the absolute minimum of this, right? Like, how how can I minimize this thing, right? Well, it's if this thing is equal to that, right? Now I'm happy. It's all done. So what I would really want to do right, is that this matrix here, if this is diagonalized by the same thing as diagonalized as this, right? So if this thing here, these two things, this becomes B, oh, this is what you said. Oh, sorry. Ah. <laughs> so if you make this B, right, now you just end up with these to cancel. Cool. So that's the first thing, right? So now I have these two. To cancel each other. So, what should I then make this thing, right? Should it have any off diagonal elements? No, because these are all zero. So, because I square the difference, it just counts up. So, what should I pick these values to be? Remember, this one, let's say that this one sorted from very large values on the diagonal to very small. Should cancel the big ones, right? So actually, the best thing I could do is if I take this thing here, be the same as this, right? But now I wanted to do dimensionality reduction, right? So let's say this one here has five values. They're like 10, and then it drops down to something, right? So what I would want, if I choose a small dimensionality, if I want a three-dimensional representation, I would just pick this to be the three largest ones of these, right? Cool, so now I've canceled that out. Right, that sounds like a really annoying way to get to a really simple problem. The, the reason why I'm doing this is that I have to remember what we're actually working with. We're working with the N by N matrix, not the D by D. Right? And we're going to see how that can be very useful. So if I pick D to B, is the first, if they're sorted, the, per, the largest eigenvalues of the matrix that I was given, then the error of this would just be all the remaining eigenvalues. That is what, what's left, right, in that, in that error term. Okay? So if I pick the top D eigenvalues, I get this. So, right? So then we said the definition then of this, D, we said comes from this product. And now the important thing is that I change where the transpose is, right? So this is an N by N. And this was equal to this. Then I can write this such as this. This is absolutely fine, right? So I just take the diagonal, the, the, the diagonal matrix I have, I take the square root of that and I write it like this. Then I can move out the transpose by flipping these around. And now you've got your Y. So that means Y in this case is taking the eigenvectors of the matrix that you were given. And then I scale them by 
each one, I scale them by the variance, right? Or that part of diagonal trace. So this here now is, is an n-dimensional vector, right? Cool. So that was a really roundabout way of getting to this thing. But now I'm going to try to convince you why that's important. I showed you this example here, where I've taken these distances from a couple of cities in the UK. Now, I have no idea where these cities are, because I, I don't know. And given that matrix, what I can do is I can now do exactly this. I have six, I've picked six cities, so I can diagonalize that matrix of distances that I want. This diagonalization, there's, there's actually only two varying components in this. I can give you a representation where there's only two degrees of freedom, which seems kind of sensible if you're in England because it's flat, right? If I would add in Europe and if I would add in, I don't know, the US, then I'll probably have three because the Earth is bending around. But in this case, I found two. And if you look at the projection of this, you got this, right? Which kind of makes sense. So you got west is the y axis and north is this. And because it's only distances, I can rotate this as much as I want and I can translate it as much as I want because I don't have the information of that, right? Cool. Where is Cambridge and Sheffield? Yeah, where is Cambridge and Sheffield? That is true. Why did it? Yeah. So I have a relationship to all these places except for Birmingham, but I think I calculated it and then I did this pop a long while ago. And then I just thought, I need something in the middle. <laughs> and then Birmingham came in. Sorry if anyone's from Birmingham. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, that's how it ended up. So this is quite a useful thing. So then. Let's just contrast these two things. So in the last thing, which is called multidimensional scaling, we're diagonalized an N by N matrix. In PCA, we diagonalize a D by D matrix. It's just where that transpose ended up. Now, the, oh, so now these two things, if we do them in a way that we compute the MDS matrix by actually taking the inner product between each vector, in the representation now, they're exactly equivalent, right? They're exactly the same solution, no difference between them at all. So then it feels a little bit silly. Why would I choose to solve an n by n eigenvalue problem when I could solve a d by d? Right? You would always solve the d by d instead. However, now there's a, there's a thing to this. So we found a geometrical embedding from a similarity relationship. Now, we started off last lecture, we said that the manifold is a topological space that near each point resembles a Euclidean space. So that means the representation that we have, if we think the data lies on the manifold, we actually have a measure of local distances. That's what we have. It's the ones we don't have, it's the global ones, right? We can't measure the global ones, okay? So what we can do is if we can come up with a measure along the manifold in some way, we can use MDS to recover, to find the representation that's effectively unraveled this manifold. So the example here that I gave, or the, the, the classic example of this, is that this thing is called a switch roll. So it's data set that lies like this. If you would apply PCA to this, dependent on which dimension X, Y, and Z varies the most, it is going to look like a Swiss roll projected onto two of those dimensions. So it's either going to take the Swiss roll and squash it over the swirls like this, boom, or it's going to find that one and you get some data looking like this. Each one of them is not what you want, right? What you really want is something that takes this Swiss roll and unrolls it, right? So it's a two-dimensional thing and every location of that is actually on this Swiss roll, right? That's what you would really want to do, okay? So we now have the technique to actually be able to do exactly this. So let's say 
that locally around this, the Euclidean distance is probably quite good, right? Because it doesn't occur very much. So if I take a couple of points like this, that distance is probably very similar to what the manifold distance should be again. It's when I take the distance from here to there, it gets really wrong. Because what I want is this part, but the distance in the parameterization I've been given is this bit, right? So what I could do is that I could compute and say, I decide some distance where the local similarity measure is valid. And then if I can come up with a way of filling in the other points, I can use the pi MBS on it. So the simplest way of doing this, and this was, feels like, yeah, it is a long time ago. Uh, this is a paper called isomap. And what it does is that it says this, right? So you decide some form of localized region that you think that you have a distance measure which actually matches the manifold distance, okay? So you do that, and then you say, as long as each point is somehow connected to each other, when I want to go from this point to here, rather than taking the distance of the parameterization, I do the shortest path by accumulating all these distances. That is going to be an approximation of actually knowing what the distance was along the manifold. Can you see that? It's like quite clever. And it's, it's one of these papers when you read it and you think, that is absolutely obvious. Why didn't I think of that? Which means it's the really, really good work. Right? It just feels obvious. This is what one should do. But no one did, and that's the clever thing you have to try. So if you do that, so you take this data, you have a set of points, you compute local distances, and then you complete every other distance with the shortest path. Then you can just apply MDS to this. And if you do this, that's what happens. Right? Now you find a two-dimensional representation, which has actually taken this and unrolled it. Right? Now, you, there's loads of different methods for completing these matrices, for taking a local measure that works in a small neighborhood and then figuring out what does it mean for larger, how we move larger patches. But as soon as you can do that, you can just apply MDS to that matrix, right? And that's where this is really, really useful, right? It's super useful to do these things. Cool. So we compute a distance matrix, convert it to inner products, you diagonalize this, and then you recover this spatial structure. So just on these things before we move on to the next part is same things I've said before, learn how to read distance matrices. It's super useful. PCA always, always, always. And the difference between the two techniques we look at, one diagonalizes D by D. So if you're just taking a global measure in your observed space, you're never ever doing MDS. It's silly. You're solving a way more bigger problem than you need to. MDS does this on an N by N matrix instead. So if you're doing something more interesting, if you have, uh, then this is really useful to do. So the cool thing with the last bit, because you have the N by N, you can non-linearize the method itself by non-linearizing the measure. So as long as you have some non-linear measure, it's going to lead to a non-linear unraveling. Awesome. So do we have any questions on that? No? Yeah. Is there a library that can do the PCA for us? There absolutely is, but it's also two lines of Python. <clears throat> so what you would do is you would normally you to compute the covariance matrix np.cov, and then to compute the embedding np.linal.i. So it's just two commands, but there is a function that does it as well, probably in sci-fi that does PCA. It probably does something more funky involved, which is actually the stuff that I'm going to tell you about now. But that one, so you can do both, right? Easy. 
So the two things then we talked then, global linear method, MBS allows for non-linearization through a localized measure. So what could be the problem of applying MBS? What could be the problem of applying something that's localized? And the hint is in the image. Think about the shortcoming of applying MBS to a problem. For example, that Swiss problem. So you see this thing, right? And that looks like the Swiss roll. And you can kind of see that we wanted to do this. But remember what we were actually doing? The algorithm took some local distances and then it tried to expand them. Actually, what the method, yeah? How do you know which is the right way? How do you not get stuck in kind of some local mirror of the minimum of the distance? Yeah, it, I, think, I think you mean what I was thinking. <laughs> So effectively, your method, say that you take this window, right, of localized distance, and within this localized window, you say here Euclidean distances make sense, right? So that's like me moving around here. If I moved around like that as a video, would you see that it's a Swiss roll? No, you would have absolutely no idea that it's a Swiss roll. And also, the noise that I've added to this is going to be local. So if I go into a very small window or something, the noise is going to be much, much more varying than if I look at it on the global scale, right? So effectively, my algorithm sees this, right? And in here, well, it's going to be quite tricky to figure out that this is the Swiss roll, right? And the other thing is, so that's a too small window. If I make it too big, yeah, if I make it this big, well, now the distance between here and those things, it, they're wrong, right? Because I'm going off the manifold, right? So this is a really, really annoying thing. So there's another way of thinking about these types of methods. And this is more, this is not stuff with PCA MDS stuff that I think you should definitely use on the project. Now I'm going to hint at a couple of other things, which I'm, I'm not going to talk about methods specifically. I just want to highlight some problems and show you other techniques, but this is not stuff that you should uh, use for the project really. So there's another way of thinking about this problem. So what we said before, the way we introduced this, is that we said, I'll take this and I'll unravel it to this. Another way of thinking about the problem is the other way around, which is actually more natural when you think about it. I have this and this thing has been done like this to get that. <laughs> no, does that make sense? So instead, I'm thinking about the process of taking the stuff that I don't have and making it to what I observe. Okay, this is something which is often referred to as unsupervised learning. So, what we're really doing in this case is that you've given me a Y, that's my data that I've seen, and I'm looking for a representation of that data X in some representation that I like, and a mapping, which is called a generative mapping, that has generated that data. Okay, that's another way of thinking about the same problem that gives us a lot of more flexibility to work with this. So let's think about this. So you've given me Y, and I want to find the X's and the function. So I always think about this as having an abacus. So now my task, my learning task, is to move these dots and give them an X location and the function that fits through them. If I have that, now I can say any X location, I can push them through the function, I get the Y location in the original space. Right? So now I've learned a representation of the data in that manner. Yeah? So, What's the problem with doing that? Does it feel like there's one solution for that problem? The analogy is that I'm here now because you can see me. Give me a path where I started this morning and a path to how I came here. Well, it can be loads, right? 
there's an infinite combination of different possible ways I could have arrived here. Right? So what we need to do in this case, what did we do when we have problems which were ill-defined or ill-posed? We've done it once in the course already. Say again? Yeah. Um, but think about what, what did we do if we had multiple possible explanations that gave the same thing? Regularization. Exactly. Right. And what was regularization? We put in a preference toward the solution that we liked. We said, you've got this whole spectrum of things that are completely equivalent. Now, I actually want that one. Right. We put in a preference to that. And therefore, we regularized the problem and made it well post. Exactly. So, this is what we did, right, in the DLM model. We added this term, which had nothing to do with the data, right? It was only about the explanation that we wanted. And we said, you can get different preferences by doing that. Cool, so let's extend that concept then. Let's do it in, in this model as well. So what we would want, right, the two things that we're looking for is a mapping and a representation. So as soon as I can encode a preference towards a, a function, well, I can use that as a regularizer, right? So in this case, and this is just a, a, a simple example, I just said, I'm going to have lines, and I'm going to say that the lines follow a probability distribution that's Gaussian. So what that mean, means here, right? That means this is my preferred solution, and this one is as bad as this one. This one I really don't like, right? So that's a preference, right? Yeah, same thing as with the, when we drew those circles for the beaters, right? This is a scale of different preferences, right? So now we're getting somewhere. So what I can now do is I can say this solution I much more like than the solution where I put all the points very close uh, in X, right? Have we nailed down the problem completely? Or another question is, given that you have a set of y values and you're free to choose the x values and you really want the flat function can you always do that <laughs> can you move this abacus to always make a line you can right you just move them to plus and minus infinity and you stretch them out it's going to be as flat as possible but kind of there's a hole in this right there's something else we also want. so we also want the other variable that we're looking for, which is the x variable, we don't want that to go crazy, right? We don't want it to be plus minus infinity and being too far away. So we can put another preference. Again, we just put a Gaussian preference here that says, you know, I would really like if you're in the same place, okay? So now that one loves this one. This is like the best thing it's ever been. Like everything is in the same place, perfect. So now what we do have, and this is what regularizes the problem, is that I have one thing that wants this, like make it as flat as possible, and the other one says, make this thing, which is the opposite of flat, right? Now we've got two things that pulls in different directions, and they have to find an agreement somehow, and that makes the problem well posed, right? So if we would do this, do -do -do, if we would do this, we can now, incorporate this into base rule, where we effectively say, I now have a preference towards the mapping, which is P of F. I have a preference over where the inputs are, P of X. And what I can derive is a distribution over what I think the mapping should be and what the location should be. So what we've really done, if I say, now I'm gonna skip the denominator in this, and I'm just gonna find the best point of this, well, effectively, what I have is that I got some error function, and then I got these regularizers, exactly in the case of the beta, right? Where we said we derived this beta from a probabilistic model, and then that's how we got our error function, and then we added these regularizers to, to it. It's exactly the same thing. They just look swanky because it says P and something with it. But it's just some terms that want some other stuff that's just part of the solution, but doesn't involve the data. Oh, oh, I have to speed up again. So if I do this here, I've taken this spiral, I mapped it to 100 dimensions, and I can actually do this. I take the linear mapping, I get this out. If 
What I've effectively done is PCA again, right? I just derived it in a completely different way. So it actually, it's exactly the same thing if your assumption that the noise, which is the in the error function, I didn't tell you that, which is also Gaussian, then if that goes to zero, it becomes the solution to this is exactly the solution that we found before. But now it was derived in a completely different way. So the last thing I then wanted to show you with this, how about nonlinearities? Now, can I do exactly the same thing with this global structure, but I just pick in nonlinearities instead? You can, if you have a preference towards different nonlinear functions. So if you take mine and Neil's course next year, you'll learn a lot about these types of nonlinear functions. These are called Gaussian processes. We're not going to talk about them, but what I'm going to tell you is that the only thing I have is that I've got a preference towards functions. Uh, but something that I can put in a function, I can say, this is how much I like this. So I can use this as a regular idea. What you can do with that, and I'm just going to show this. So my friend, uh, where is he? There. Oh, here. So my friend done this project, which I think is really, really cool. So what he has is that he got a database of uh, forms. And he's made a curve around each letter. I think the number of points is 1,024. So now in 2D, you've got 2,048 dimensional data. So I try and look at this. It doesn't make any sense at all, right? 2,048 dimensional data. Super high. Then what he says, he takes exactly the approach that we've done. He says, I like the data to be close. And then I have a preference towards some crazy mapping, right? According to this uh, preference. Then we better. This here is the two-dimensional representation that he learns of this. What you can now do is, if I move around in this space, I get this, right? How many things in this space in the 2048 dimensional space is actually the letter A, or well, pretty much nothing, right? But you can see, do you see me generating any cats? No, right? This is very, very cool, right? So now what we have is that we've got a two-dimensional representation of that. Let's take some funny one, four. You can, if you start thinking about these, what they actually, what these dimensions actually do. Quite cool, right? So what I've now developed, or what I have developed, I haven't developed, we've developed, is just another use for visualization, right? This data is really, really hard to figure, or this data is really, really thick, hard to figure out what the structure is, it's really hard to work with, because most of the stuff you're going to do is actually not going to be a letter or a digit, right? Now we have this two-dimensional representation that we can work with instead. That's super useful. And even more importantly, if you're in this process where you're working with the domain expert on something, right, they need to understand what the data actually is, right? They have much less data science skills than you have, but they have much more in-depth knowledge about the data. This here allows you to explore it, right? You can start thinking, oh, why is this one alone here? Oh, I can kind of see by that one alone. That's the really cool form, right? You can start exploring that data. How would you do that from the 2048 dimensional data? You wouldn't. It's really, really hard. Good. Um, so, just then, I'm already done. So, basically, the things I've said a couple of times before. So, do visualization with all of these things. Do PCA. Because what you can always do with PCA, because it's a linear and a global method, even though we don't do it through this nice statistical framework that we said, oh, we have multiple solutions, I encode preferences, it will work, right? You can kind of trust the eigenvalue problem that you do. You're going to get the interesting stuff. If you do MDS on things, which you might come up with a sensible way of doing, be really careful about how you interpret the results. Because you have to say, because I put this in, then it looks like that. With PCA, you can kind of be a lot safer. These nonlinear things through MDS, 
are super useful, but uh, again, be a little bit careful uh, of applying them. And then you know that there's this whole set of stuff for next year, looking at these other cool methods. And with that, I'm going to end. Sorry for again being late. <laughs> Do we have any questions? We'll stop this.